Heavenly Father, we just come before you as your children uh, tonight, and we ask, Lord, that uh, you would have mercy on the people of Ukraine, Lord. Lord, have mercy on those that are uh, hiding all night long as they fear for themselves, for their children. Have mercy on those families that said goodbye to brothers and to dads as uh, they left families behind uh, to defend their homeland. Father, we want to pray for peace. We want to pray for a resolution. Uh, be with those that are reaching out uh, to those that are involved. And, uh, Lord, uh, you tell us to pray for our enemies. And so we, uh, we, just, uh, we lift up uh, the leadership of Russia to you, Lord. Lord, in, in the every sense of the word, we, we know that our enemy is not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not Vladimir Putin, Lord. It's in all the forces of darkness and uh, all the unseen things that are gathering against your people, Lord. That's what's broken this world. And that's what continues to break it. And so we pray for Vladimir Putin, Lord. I pray that you'd break his heart, that you would shine the light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus that it would shine through all of the lies and Lord as fingers are being pointed as people are talking about on all sides corruption Lord we as a nation we're no one to, to point fingers and say you're corrupt we're not Lord we are all broken apart from Jesus Christ how we need you how we need the fruit of your spirit to wash over us to fill us and to be, um, Lord, uh, to make us sons and daughters of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, your love is the peace that we need. Build our faith, Lord. Make us people of hope in a frightened and fearful word, world, Lord our tongues, Lord, and our mouths with the message of the peace that comes only through Jesus. It's in his name we pray. In a dry and weary
From the pastures we call grace, a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep and empty grave. So I will praise you on the mountain, and I will praise you when the mountains in my way. You're the sun and where my feet So I will praise you in the valleys of the sun. Scripture reading for you this evening, Ephesians 2, chapter 2, 11 through 22. Therefore remember, for, therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by, so, by the so-called circumcisions, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the divided, dividing wall by abolishing in the flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so that he himself, he might make the two into one, new man thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body, to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enemy. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our cross and one spirit of the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints in our God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. When I was 18 years old I wouldn't have been able to do that through the Holy Spirit because I had a disability um, and but the Holy Spirit works in many many different ways. Um, there's a lot of people here tonight, and there's a lot of issues going on throughout the world. And by a raise of hand, if you know somebody that's going through a, a physical ailment, a spiritual ailment, um, financial, or, and also emotional, that those are real, real problems. If you want, just raise your hand with me, because I have many of those friends, <laughs> friends and loved ones that are going through a lot of problems. And you see those people with their hands up. That means you're not alone. We're all in this together through the Spirit of Christ. And so I just want you to realize that. You're not alone. The Holy Spirit is here with us and guiding us and giving us peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this evening. And we do lift our hands to you, Lord, and surrender. That we give all of our loved ones that are going through issues to you, to you right now. From brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews and and fathers and stepfathers and mothers and just all of our loved ones that are going through issues, Lord. They're, you know our hearts, you know our minds. We just lift them to you right now. But also, Lord, we want to lift up Forest Hill Church to you. 
As we continue to go forward, Lord, we want to thank you for bringing us to this new place. As we welcome Ethan this evening, Lord, as, as our new pastor, his first night coming to preach as our pastor. We want to lift him and, and Catherine and Henry up to you right now and keep them in your hands. Bruce, Sarah, and the girls as well. As we're all going through a new time, I just want to lift up the elders as we go forward as well, that we can do your will and be in your presence as we do it. Lord, thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Ethan. Thanks, Tiger. appreciate uh, your uh, scripture reading, sharing your heart for uh, praying for us. Uh, Bruce, thanks for leading the service uh, this morning. It's, uh, wow, it's really exciting to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Ethan, and uh, they just offered me a job here. Uh, so it's really uh, exciting uh, to, you know, see this day come to fruition. Of course, this is, you know, uh, uh, the type of moment that I've anticipated for most of my adult life. We're, we're super thrilled to be here. I mean, I don't, I don't know if my face it can show it all the time, but we really are thrilled uh, to be here. And I, I need to tell my face that sometimes uh, because of everything we're doing. I mean, I still haven't found all my clothes. You know, we're still looking for, for our stuff. And um, above all, it's just an honor to be called to be your pastor. I mean, to, to me, there, there isn't a greater honor I could have received. And I was a U.S. Marine. And I, this, is, this is so far beyond anything that someone has endowed onto me. Uh, so thank you. It's such a privilege and an honor to be called to be a, a pastor here. Well, uh, for this uh, first sermon, I'd just like to introduce myself a little bit more and um, what God's put on my heart for ministry, but I'd like to survey the book of Ephesians uh, in doing that because um, I'm going to be preaching through Ephesians as the first uh, sermon series uh, that we'll go through together. Um, it wasn't uh, too long ago. I went back to my elementary school as a U.S. Marine to um, take some questions and answers. Now, this was a Christian school, and it was in Massachusetts. I was stumped by a third grader. I, I was floored. Uh, he said, hey, um, Ethan, my favorite, uh, my life verse in the Bible is uh, Joshua, blah, 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 and it says that to be strong and courageous, and this and that, and he quoted it for me, and he said, what's your life verse? And I didn't have a life verse. I mean, what do you tell a third grader? Who asked you that question when you don't have a life verse? I thought, I need to get one of those. <laughs> and so I thought about it. I mean, that really uh, riddled, riddled me for the weeks to come. And I came across um, Acts 20, 24. Is there a possible way? <laughs> uh, I'll just switch them out. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I got a few, a few too many books here. So I'm thinking about, okay, is, is there a life verse that I could, um, uh, that I could find for, for myself, something that was going to energize me in my life as a Christian? Uh, I came across Acts 20, 24. I don't know uh, how I came across this verse, but I came across Acts 20, 24. And strangely enough, as we're going to go through Ephesians, this uh, comes in Paul's the Apostle Paul's speech to the elders of Ephesus. His final speech as he says farewell to them. And he says in verse 24, he said that I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only this. And I wonder what that would be for you. Uh, you wouldn't consider, consider your life worth anything unless you could do this one thing. What would that one thing be? If I can just do this, then maybe I can consider my life valuable to myself. This is what Paul says, that for me, I finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I identified with that verse personally. Um, I joined the Marine Corps because I wanted to be a state trooper. And I had all these goals in mind, but you know, when I got into the Marine Corps, I was doing well. And I was doing college and a lot of officers and higher-ups in the Marine Corps told me, Ethan, you really need to consider becoming an officer, you know, uh, switching, switching over uh, to the dark side. Be an officer. Uh, you're a good leader. You're, you're intelligent. And I thought, you know what? There might be right. Maybe this would be a good move for me. 
But what about the state trooper thing? I mean, those guys are cool too. They look good. I could go back to Massachusetts, my home state. But you know, while I was doing college, I was doing um, English as my undergraduate work while I was enlisted. And I thought, man, I really like literature. Man, wouldn't it be cool to be a junior high English teacher the rest of my life? I think that's a simple, humble life, and I think I would be full of joy if I did that. And I'm thinking, man, what should I do? I have all this stuff that I'd like to do, but I was growing in my faith, and and it was always in the back of my mind. Well, maybe one day I'd become a pastor. Maybe I could do some of this stuff and then become a pastor later. And whenever I would imagine my life not pastoring a church, I felt a little empty. I could never imagine my life pastoring a church and feeling a little empty. But I could imagine my life as a state trooper, or an officer in the Marine Corps, or even a junior high English teacher, and feel a little bit empty with that thought. So I identified with uh, this verse, and Acts 20, 24 continues to be for me, and and I think it will forever be for me, uh, the engine to energize me in this calling, and an anchor to stabilize me uh, through uh, what life will bring. Catherine and I feel as much excitement and peace about being at Forest Hill Church than we ever imagined uh, we would when we dreamed about a church that God might bring us to. Um, There's been so much um, confirmation and peace along the way, this whole uh, process getting here. Um, And even when I was offered the job, I still had to choose whether or not to accept it. And we were thinking at the dinner table, is this really it? Is this really it? Can we be, how can we be sure? I mean, do, I, do we really know? Are we going to make a decision that uh, we could be all wrong about? And we couldn't figure out how to calculate to know. And then we just stepped back and saw the big picture. Just said, relax. Think about this. Ethan, you would like to pastor a small congregation in New England. Well, there happens to be one that ask you to be their pastor. And it was as simple as that. It really was where we felt the confirmation uh, to come. Well, as I talked with the elders, uh, Bruce, Tiger, and Ben, about, okay, so what really do you guys want me to do? I mean, uh, let's say I started failing at all these things. What would be the last thing that you would want me to fail at? And they said, preaching. That's the last thing we'd want you to fail at is preaching. So as I thought about what should I do, I remembered my candidating sermon in the opening passage of Ephesians and thought that would be a good book, I think, to walk through section by section with you. So in the remainder of our time, uh, I want to just highlight a couple themes that we're going to see in Ephesians again and again uh, because they relate uh, so much to what I'm passionate about regarding my calling as a pastor. So I think you'll get to know what uh, drives me a little bit more, but also you'll get a preview of things that we're going to see again and again through the letter of Ephesians. So if you're not there, turn to the letter of Ephesians in your Bible. Uh, We're going to kind of jump around just a little bit, but just two themes that we're going to look at. Two themes. The first theme, well, here's the title of the sermon. This is probably the longest title of a sermon I'll ever uh, produce. It's uh, a bird's eye view of Ephesians. And how that relates to my passion for pastoral ministry. I promise I'll never make another title that long. But a bird's eye view of Ephesians here. Here's the first theme that we'll see in Ephesians in the weeks ahead. It's what I call kinetic theology. Kinetic theology. Do you know the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy? Kinetic energy is energy that is in motion. Potential energy is... Energy that is in place. So, for example, if you're holding a balloon, the air inside the balloon as you're holding it is only potential because the balloon is staying in place. But if you let it go and let it rip, let it flutter around the room, the energy is kinetic now because it's bringing the balloon in motion. Well, what kind of energy does theology bring to your life? What kind of energy does learning about who God is and what God does, what kind of energy does that bring to your life? What kind of energy does our weekly worship as a church together bring to your life? Is it kinetic or potential? Does it bring movement or do you 
find yourself remaining in place. Well, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul describes for us a kinetic theology. One place we see this kinetic theology is in chapter 2, verse 1 and 10. Verse 1 through 10. I won't read this whole thing, but if you look at verse 1, he says, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which, in which you used to live. This section begins by saying that before we knew God personally or trusted in him, we were spiritually dead, but we were kind of like, like the walking dead almost. As Paul writes, we were walking dead in our sinful nature, which fed on self-serving desires. And the hinge of this section is verse 4. Verse 4, he says, But God, but God in his great love for us, this God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. But this is not where Paul ends his thought. Look down at verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So he says, you used to live like this, but God intervened and brought new life to you. And he made you a new type of person which lives like this with a new nature. And Paul writes later in chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, in light of these things, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. So Christian, brother and sister in Christ, you have not simply been forgiven of your sin. You have not simply been given the righteousness of Christ You have not simply been reconciled to God or um, simply sealed for a future hope in heaven. You have been given a calling. You've been given a calling. You've been made new to live new for God. Therefore, walk in step with that calling. And yet we're not left uh, to our own ideas or devices to know uh, how to carry out this calling God has given us a blueprint, a reference point, if you will, so that we can always look back as a picture to how our new lives in Christ ought to look. And that reference point that we're to look back on is himself. He says, look to me. And I only need a minute to show you this part because this whole past sermon series of Bruce's on mission with God, he's been beating this drum for you each Sunday as those who have been made in the image of God were ought to reflect his own character and nature. So Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, follow God's example. Follow God's example. This is what he's talking about. Now, one thing that I learned as a son of a carpenter, something very important, is that when you are creating duplicates of something, uh, you need Um, The same model for every piece. And I learned this the hard way. Making duplicates of certain sizes of pieces of wood. If I make a duplicate, and then I make copies based on the duplicate, and make more copies based on that duplicate, the error that you made that you didn't know is only expanding every time you make a duplicate. So take the model, and you use the model for every duplicate you make. So if you make a mistake, you at least just make it once and you don't have a crooked house. When we are considering living this new life in Christ, who do we look for as a model? Um, Do you look to a a special Christian that you know you think is doing really well? Or a leader that you think has got it right? No, God says, Follow my example. I made you. I'm the model. I'm the only objective reality which can inform all my creatures that I've made to reflect my image. We're to look to God's example, and this is what we'll see through Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians. We'll see this in things like he says... Uh, love one another, and he'll say, just as Christ loved you. Or he'll say, forgive one another, just as God has forgiven you. Uh, Perhaps you might think, what kind of person should I be? What kind of calling, uh, how should my calling in life be played out? 
we will always be able to look back at who God is and what God has done as our model. This is why we must scour the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge of God as revealed in his word so that we might glorify him by knowing and being and doing all the more everything that he's called us to be. Biblical theology is not dry or boring or irrelevant for a church like Forestdale today, or any church for that matter. It is kinetic. It brings movement. When we see and savor who God is and what he has done, we will be radically changed and progressively formed into the types of uh, people he is making us to be and into the type of church that he's making us to be. My desire as a pastor is to see people who are these walking dead, right? In their sin, I, my desire is to see them be made alive in Christ, to know God, to be radically changed in their beliefs, in their um, uh, being and who they think they are and, and in their lifestyle. But for those who are Christians, for the members of this church, my desire is that I can participate with what God is doing in your life to progressively form you into the types of people he's called you to be. And then we'll take turns because I need you to be that for me so that in each of our lives is reflected the character and nature of God. Well, as we go through Ephesians, there will be particular points of theology uh, that Paul will emphasize, and, and we'll get to them all in due time and, and in the order as the text presents them, all filling out the grandeur of this calling that God has given us in Christ, but of all the theological depth you could find in Ephesians, there is perhaps one aspect of theology in our calling, which is most prominent in this letter. And this will be the second thing that I want to point out. In some ways, the search committee of Forestdale, who was looking for a pastor, kind of beat me to the punch here on this one. Um, as I came to the church, the first time I got to visit the church, uh, to just for an informal meet and greet time, and we got to ask each other questions to get to know each other a little bit, I asked the search committee, is, is there a particular theological point or doctrine that's really on your heart as a church? Is there something that's really important to you as a church, theologically speaking? I mean, you have, you have the this church and the that church and the this church and the that church, and they're all about this and they're all about that. We all have our hobbies, right? What is really on the heart of Forestdale? And, and I can't remember who uh, said this, but nobody had objected, so I just went with it. They said unity. Unity. That we be united together as one body. I thought that was a great answer. I was so encouraged by that answer. Probably more so than any other answer I might have heard. Well, this is certainly near and dear to God's heart, as uh, the Apostle Paul refers to it again and again, that the, the loving unity of a church um, is one of the best ways to reflect God's own character and nature as a triune being that he is. I believe this is the aim for Paul, actually, in writing the letter of Ephesians, to support and encourage the loving unity of the church at Ephesus and for all churches thereafter. Um, structurally, this topic of unity falls in the center of the, the whole letter. Second, it takes up most of his ink. Most of what he writes about is supporting unity. And third, it's constantly inserted into all the other topics that he talks about as if it's a foundational principle which is supporting everything else. Remember, theology is kinetic. So what is the kinetic theology which energizes our loving unity as a church well there's at least three points that are expressed in ephesians first as i preached in my candidating sermon ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14 paul opens his letter talking about our union with christ our individual personal union with christ if you're a believer and you have the holy spirit uh, this Christ, this means christians are united to christ such that we receive all the blessings and rewards that he himself earned before God. Well, isn't that a relief? I mean, do you find yourself trying to earn favor with God, earn rewards? 
hoping that he finds you pleasing. Well, Paul is saying, you're united to Christ. You, you actually inherit all the blessings and rewards that he receives. You're treated as if he was you and you were him. That's an amazing doctrine, and it, and it flows into our call to be um, unified as a church because we are united to Christ. Second, in being united to Christ, we're also united to one another through the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 14 to 21, which Tiger read for us a few minutes ago, that Christ's work on the cross abolished boundaries that would separate us. For example, he says in verse 19, it says, you Gentiles, so non-Jewish person, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. So we are taken from all sorts of places and we are brought together as fellow citizens of the same nation, the kingdom of God. We are adopted from all other families and we're brought together and reared together in one house as brothers and sisters. We're taken from different places off the shelf and we're jointed and knit together uh, to form one building. Paul will talk about this structural support of the foundation that the apostles and prophets built, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone of this foundation. Therefore, we are called to loving unity as a church. And third, Paul writes later in Ephesians chapter 4 that God gave gifts of leadership to the church. He talks about evangelists, uh, apostles, prophets. He talks about elders. This is an um, office of leadership that is still active and present in churches today. Look over at Ephesians chapter 4. We'll just read a couple of verses on this. Starting in verse 11, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He says that these gifts of leadership were given for what purpose? Verse 11, to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Well, to what end? Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 16. For from Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, that's you and me, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Therefore, Forest Hill Church, we are called to a loving unity as a church because of what God has done uh, for us in Christ, because of what God has done for us through his spirit, uniting us together, and for what he has done in giving gifts of leadership to the church to cultivate as gardeners this loving unity. And in my life as a Christian growing in the Lord, I have seen this type of Christian unity all over, and it's deeply impacted my faith, big time. It's one of the reasons I can say I'm still a Christian is because of this. I grew up in a kind of boxed-in church, the opposite, you would say. Great church, very thankful that I grew up in this church, but they didn't have relationships with other churches, really, around them. And just the nature of growing up in one place, I hadn't been exposed at that time to other cultures and other types of ch churches. Of course, the, the Marine Corps helped with that, um, giving me orders to go around to different places. But the first kind of Christian community I met in the Marine Corps was just among Christian Marines. It was uh, pretty cool. We were a rare breed. And so it was always exciting and fun to find another Marine in, uh, cr Christian in the Marine Corps to fellowship with. But, but then I got my first assignment um, to Barbados. I was a, a security guard at the American Embassy in Barbados. There was only five other Marines there. And so I was doing my best to try to find a, a church that I could go to, to continue to grow in my faith. And the church that I found was um, run and established by a small group of women, although many people came to the church. They streamed a, um, a sermon from the United States. So we would watch it on the screen. But then they had a, a Bible study in the middle of the week. I'm like, great, now I really can, can learn and study the Bible. And I went there, and it was all middle-aged women. And I said, can I still come? They said, sure, it was, and, and I was in that Bible study for six months, and it was amazing, uh, uh, growing in, in fellowship. How, what is going on? A 20-year-old Marine 
is becoming best friends with middle-aged women in Barbados. Like, without skipping a beat. I went to, after there, I went to Virginia, and I was in a, a Baptist church in Virginia. Um, I told the pastors, hey, I think I might want to be a pastor one day, but I'm not sure. I just wanted to let you know. Let me know what I can do, do here. And they would take me on rides and take me to their meetings, their business meetings. Uh, you know, I felt like the uh, armor bearer that was just sitting in the background as the knights discussed their business. It was so cool to have that kind of uh, bird's eye view. I didn't ask for that kind of thing. They just took me in and assumed... Um, and assumed that it was just the right thing to do. I had such great mentorship there. Uh, I really grew in my faith. I saw, wow, ministry can be joyful. It can, there was such a family dynamic in the, in the church. The next assignment was South Africa. And the closest church down the street from the consulate where I worked, where I could ride my bike, happened to be an Anglican church. I didn't know anything about that, and I didn't know they were Anglican. They sprung it on me. Uh, after uh, a couple months there. But I, uh, I emailed the associate pastor and I said, hey, my name's Ethan. I'll be working here for about a year. I'd love to be part of your church. I think I might want to be a pastor one day. Do you think there's any men in the church I could spend time with that could help me grow and know where to land when I leave here? And he said, oh, yes. You know, come, you know, meet, meet me at next Tuesday at blah, blah, blah. And he wanted me for himself. He didn't want to share me. And he taught me how to read the Bible. He, he really did. He gave me books about how to read the Bible well, just creatively understanding um, narrative flow and the insights of, of the authors here. He taught me how to break down a passage and form a sermon. And he didn't seem bothered that I had come from a Baptist church or that I was American uh, either. Where would I go next? Well, we would go to San Diego, and then I'd go to seminary to learn theology, and it was a Presbyterian school. So I'm really um, being bold here, um, just jumping around like this. And, and uh, after uh, a couple of years being at the school, um, a professor said, oh, you're a Baptist? Oh, I didn't know that. They treated me like one of their own, like one of their own little Presbyterian children that they're raising up to serve their Presbyterian churches, which I was never going to do never got treated differently we were one in christ we were on the same team the, the examples and impressions that that these churches had on me was incredible um, we would be so impressed by these people that we would uh Catherine and i decided to join a presbyterian church my final year of seminary before we moved out here just to have a year of rest and we signed up for a home group bible study and uh the uh, people in church said, oh, we know a perfect Bible study for you guys. You, you fit right in. And so we go to this uh, home group Bible study on like a Tuesday night or something. And we walk in. And the youngest people in the room were maybe 68. And uh, we looked at each other and said, uh, all right, uh, we'll give it one week. We'll give it an honest try. And then we'll see afterwards and we'll talk. And we left that group and we said, this is our group. Those people were humble. They were confessing their sins, saying, I've had a bad attitude about this election, blah, blah, blah. How can we grow? Didn't you see that in the sermon? They were eager and energized to grow in their faith. And, and we just said, hey, when we're, when we're that old, if the Lord lets us live such a long life, we will want to be like that. I want to be like that. And so let's spend time with people like, like them. So we saw the unity of the church spanning across ethnic boundaries, cultural boundaries, and it's deeply impacted our faith, and it's so much of Ephesians. I mean, they're just, these churches are just being biblical. They're not being uh, unique. They're not doing something new. They're doing something that we're called to do and be, and it was extremely powerful when we saw that in our life, and, and we've already seen that here at Forest Hill Church. The search committee, for example, they came together with a shared vision, with one vision that they had, and they were able to clearly and thoughtfully present that to me and Catherine. Every time that we had to interact with them, whether it was an interview or it was a meeting, it was just fun. It was just fun. I don't know what else to say. We were excited every time we got another chance to meet someone from the search committee. And, uh, you know, we, we've been staying with the Keelers. Their hospitality has been, like, through the roof. No questions asked. Love you in advance. Don't need to earn it. 
That's amazing. That's incredible. That's special. You guys are fulfilling the calling God has given you as a church, and I just want to be part of that as we move forward together. That's meant so much to uh, me and Catherine that we've seen. These are the signs of a unified church, and when we are united in Christ on the same mission with the same vision, we reflect the very character of God who, as a triune being, is united together perfectly in their being, in their will, and their work. No member of the Trinity is rogue. They're united perfectly together. And when we are unified as a church, we also reflect our union with Christ. For in Christ, there is no class distinction. There's no gender distinction. There's no ethnic distinction, which would put certain people in privileged positions over others. Because we are brought in and we're counted as holy on account of who Christ is and what Christ has done. Not because of anything we've done or anything we bring to the table. That's why I could go to a Baptist church in Virginia, an Anglican church in South Africa, and a Presbyterian church in California, and grow and participate in each church without skipping a beat. And it was so um, exciting and encouraging to grow in those ways, to see this kinetic theology of the unity of the church. My desire is for us as a church to gr- is to continue growing in the unity that we've already seen from, from you all as a local church, for the watching uh, world of our neighbors here to look on to this loving unity and, and be confused, to say, how can it be that an assembly of people who are obviously different from one another be so alike at the same time? I mean, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to hang out with Tiger on Tuesday. He's a little bit older than me. It's not every day you see two guys like, in these di- di- different demographics, hanging out and enjoying time together, and someone comes up, oh, is this your dad? No, it's just my, my friend. Uh, we go to church together. Let's confuse our neighborhood with the unity that they would see in this mixed assembly so that we may know God more, so that we may stand in awe of him in worship together so that we may reflect his characteristics and attributes. So that we may ever grow more and more in unity with one another. And so that we may display the richness of life in Christ to a watching world. I'll conclude with Paul's prayer for Ephesians that he says in chapter 3. as my own prayer for you all. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 Paul says, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you for a still church with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or think according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray together now. God, we thank you so much for bringing us together on this windy night. It's a joy to be with your people. It's a joy to be receiving a calling to know that you have me in mind. You have a purpose for me here. I pray that as people come to this church, they would know that they have a purpose here too. I love you, Lord, and I thank you for the time of worship we've had uh, tonight. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
unity. Let's sing that chorus one last time. It's all about you, Jesus, and now this is for you. If you should do things by you alone are God, and I surrender to your will. God bless.